Okay. Good morning once again and welcome to NDC Copenhagen. My name is Mauro and as you get, may guess by my accent, I'm Italian. So up to you to, this, to decide if you want to be sorry because of my accent or because of the fact that I'm Italian. So. I'm a remote worker, so I'm fully 100% remote, as all my colleagues, by the way. But the flat we live in is unfortunately too small, so I don't have a room in my flat to work from. So I rented an office that is a couple of kilometers far away from where I live, and I usually bike ride there. So, and my favorite snacks are bananas. So can you imagine what happens when you put a banana in the backpack huh, while bike riding? So if you experience that, <laughs> you realize that it's a, an interesting failure. So you're, basically your snack is dead in the backpack as well. So the first thing I did uh, after experiencing that for a couple of times was to head to Amazon and look for a banana protector. <laughs> so <laughs> whose goal was to basically save my snacks and the backpack as well. So <laughs> I got to this page, looked for the best product with the best reviews, because you know, that matters a lot. <laughs> and finally, I added the product to the shopping cart. And I, as soon as I added the product to the shopping cart, the architect that constantly lives in the back of my mind and popped up saying, how such a thing could be designed? So it, imagine ourselves uh, sitting uh, on the other side of the screen inside the Amazon offices coding such a thing. How would it look like? So, at the first look, it sounds like a very nice looking aggregate, doesn't it? We have a shopping cart, it's a concept. It's something that it's really, really aligned with the user mental model. Business people talks about shopping carts all the time, talks about adding products to the shopping cart, changing the quantity, removing products for the shop, from the shopping cart. So why not modeling that as an aggregate? It even has behaviors. <clears throat> if you look at the web page, we have the delete behavior to remove something from the shopping cart, the save for later behavior to move that outside of the shopping cart on the same, in the same area so that I can remind myself I want to buy it sooner or later, and I can change the quantity. <clears throat> So it sounds, it fits the perfect definition of an aggregate, data and behaviors. So why not? Let's try to apply a few business requirements to such a nice looking aggregate then. The first one sounds like a simple one. We want to be sure that the price doesn't really change when an item is in the shopping cart. So we don't want to transparently basically steal money from our users. That seems like a fair one. So <clears throat> pricing is something that is not really owned by the shopping cart. So there's someone we can call the sales team or the sales aggregator that owns the price. So it sounds legitimate at this point to say, well, you know what? Whenever we add an item to the shopping cart, why not copying the price over there? Denormalization for the win, and we, we obtain is basically we satisfied uh, the business requirement because now whenever the price change, it will change here, and it won't affect in any way the shopping cart. So we're safe from that perspective. Okay, so far so good. Let's go ahead with the second one. The business comes to us and says, well, you know what? I'd like to be able to show on the product page, on the shopping cart, whenever we talk about products in general, the availability in stock. How many items we have in stock for that specific item? Might be a fake information because we want to try to convince people to buy stuff, that we're running out of stuff that's not really true, but it doesn't really matter the, where the number comes from, what, what, what the purpose of the number is. The <clears throat> it sounds like it's not really a big deal, once again. So we have warehouse, that is the one owning the inventory count. 
they can now say, well, whenever we add an item to the shopping cart, we're going to ask Warehouse, hey, can you give me the current inventory of that item? And I'm going to copy over that item to the shopping cart. So doesn't seem to be a big deal. However, we have an interesting problem now. Availability changes over time, much more than pricing. So that's the first smell, isn't it? So what happens is that whenever the inventory count changes, now a warehouse needs to do, hey, shopping cart, or to be precise, shopping carts. Do you have an item identified by item ID ABC in one of your shopping carts? If yes, can you please change the quantity for all of them? Because it just changed. Might be done eventually consistent way, using a message, might be done using an HTTP request, no matter the, the transport you're using to try to achieve this goal. But you have this kind of uh, dependency between two items. They should not depend upon each other. So let's go ahead. <clears throat> Third business requirement. Law says, unfortunately, we have rules <laughs> we need to obey to, that <clears throat> we cannot really, at least at the, the rule, I guess it's the, the law in the US as well, because this screenshot comes from the US. But the behavior is the same from the Italian websites. So if the price changes, that item cannot be left in the shopping cart. So because the problem is users might not realize that the price changed. We want to sell at the new price because the, the price change might be drastic. Let's say from $10 to 15. So it's the 50% more. So it's not a big change <laughs> as, a, in, as a unit, but it's the 50% more. So Low says you cannot leave the, the thing in the shopping cart. You need to move it out so that users cannot uh, Unadvertently, I think it's the English word, buy it, so unexpectedly buy it without realizing the price changed. However, we as the company trying to sell stuff, we want to make user aware that, well, the price changed and it's here and it's there on the same page. It's just outside of your shopping cart. So why not use the save for later feature? Something like that. So we want to be able to notify the the, the kind of the change, increased, decreased, show the amounts and move the item outside of the shopping cart into the saved for later area. Fine. So now price is not enough in the shopping cart anymore because in order to show the difference, we need to be able to keep track of that. So we need to change the shopping cart structure in order to be able to say, well, you know what? I have the current price and I have the last price that represented the, the, the time when the price, the, the time the item was added to the cart and the time now, what the price is now. So sales now, whenever the price changes, needs to shopping carts. Do you have item ABC somewhere? If yes, can you please swap the prices and update uh, the current one with the current price and move the old one to the last price and please move it to the save for later. So sales is now dictating to someone else, please do this for me. Okay? It's becoming messy, isn't it? So now whenever there's a price change and in a large e-commerce website that might happen quite frequently and whenever there's a, an inventory change and that happens a lot we have this now interesting source of congestion or contention or we're, we're fighting over kind of a single resource over here in order to try to do stuff we should not do from the outside and if you think about it, the, the big picture is even messier. So think about marketing. Marketing owns the name of the, and the description of the things that we have in the shopping cart. If we added the name and description here, every single time we add something to the shopping cart, we need to ask marketing, can you please copy over your stuff here? And shipping 
does the same. So if shipping is responsible for the delivery type or delivery estimates or things like that, then shipping needs to be involved whenever we touch the shopping cart in copying data over. And if something changes, in updating data to the shopping cart. What have we lost immediately here? Autonomy is basically gone. So one of the things we strive for, that is autonomy in designing components, is basically non-existent due to the fact that we need to have components that clearly shouldn't be dependent upon each other. We need to have them being able to talk to each other. And even worse, being able to have one component, such as, for example, sales, or the pricing component, whatever you want to call it, being able to dictate to someone else that is not really under his con their, their control to do something for me. Move it to save it for later. That's a behavior that belongs to the shopping cart. Doesn't really belong to sales. At least uh, that's the way the business described the thing. So um, in essence, the question we should try to answer is, can we get rid of all this coupling? Because that's effectively coupling. There's many type of coupling inside here. We might have technical coupling. Because if, we're, if, you, if we are using HTTP over here, we're bound to the communication channel. We have temporal coupling. Because if we're using HTTP over here, these two guys must be online at the same time in order to satisfy the request. And if the shopping cart is overloaded by high throughput, as soon as sales comes in and say, hey, change the price, the shopping cart may say, go away, time out. You cannot do it. And then we have deployment coupling. Because as soon as we try to change the shopping cart and deploy it, we might break sales or warehouse or shipping. And the other way around, if shipping needs to change, we might realize, oh, God, we need to change the way shopping carts now behave because we changed the way we structured ourselves in managing delivery estimates. Whatever sample is sweet, better for you. It's, it's good. And then we have people coupling. So teams in a large infrastructure that, might, that should be completely independent, such as, well, I'm managing inventory. I know nothing about shopping carts. I, I don't even live in the same time zone as the team that manages the shopping cart. Now I need to be able to talk to the shopping cart people in order to say, well, look, I need to deploy. <laughs> Can you please stop applying changes for a while? Because our deployment is so big and huge and monolithic huh, that we need to stop you in order to be able to deploy. That's, all these are source of coupling. They have different names, but in the end, under the hood, that this is coupling. The thing we should realize in the end is that the shopping cart doesn't really exist. So um, the business talks about the shopping cart. The UI talks about shopping carts. But if we try to decline that concept in, onto the architecture and into the technical side of things, we should realize such as the spoon doesn't exist, huh? the shopping cart doesn't really exist, or it's not really required to exist. Let's put it this way. That sounds better. So let's try to decompose the shopping cart. So let's try to bring the aggregate concept from domain driven design to the next level. We have all these actors, aggregates, services, microservices, autonomous components, all these names. I guess that they fit very well into the picture. So you can name all these boxes using one of these names. Looking at the first business requirement, we have sales that needs to deal with prices inside the shopping cart. So let's tear that apart. Let's remove the current price, last price, and quantity from the shopping cart and move it under the sales control. So we have a list of items with IDs, Prices, so current and last, and quantities. Quantities are required because we need to be able to calculate the total amount so that the user pays. <coughs> Let's do the same thing with warehouse. Warehouse needs to deal with inventory. 
So we need quantity in order to be able to understand how many items are currently living in shopping carts huh, so that we can calculate and forecast the inventory. And let's do the same with shipping. Shipping cares about delivery estimates only. So we need the item ID, the quantity, so to understand how big the package will be and understand, well, this package shipped to Italy from the US will take a week. So that's the estimate. Fine. Marketing doesn't really change. There's no point in copying data, data over. The only good reason for marketing, so in this case name and description, to change are typos. And it's perfectly fine that fixing a typo is a kind of normalized operation. So it's immediately reflect, reflected everywhere that information is used. So it's fair to ass assume that marketing doesn't need at all for this specific requirement, this display name and description somewhere, any shopping cart concept. Marketing might need a shopping cart concept to say, well, yeah, I know, you know what? I want to understand, I want to get stats about the usage of the shopping carts. I want to get stats about how many products get in and get out of shopping carts and understand the user behaviors and stuff like that. But for, for, for this purpose, marketing doesn't really care about shopping carts in general. Do we need a shopping cart at all at this point? Not really. So what we can do is basically assign the shopping cart concept uh, as ownership to sales, uh, saying you own the cart ID. That means that whenever, if I'm a new user on the website and I click for the first time ever add the shopping cart, uh, a cart ID must be created for me. Sales is the one responsible of saying, here is the new cart ID. That's it. That's all what we need in order to say a cart exists. That's good enough, from, even from the technical perspective, to get this going. <coughs> what have we done by following this uh, decomposition approach? So if we compare this picture to the previous one, the big picture, <coughs> where we had many arrows going, crossing, effectively crossing boundaries, we still have arrows if you think about it but we just follow the coupling. So we accepted that coupling exists, it's in the nature of things. So sales is coupled in some way with the fact that, or is cohesive, we should say, that is the positive side of coupling, is cohesive with saying, well, we need to update prices in, the, in shopping carts. But we can do that in our subdomain or in, other, in our service boundary, or in our bounded context, whatever you want to call it. Warehouse does the same. At this point, given that sales owns this information, what sales can do is, can I do this in a transaction? Yes, it's my field. I own everything. So if we need to be transactionally consistent, we can. Those two things can live on the same database. That's not a problem at all. It's owned by sales. So we can, have, we can even pay the price of having the DTC running here. That's not a big problem at all. So we might be, have two different SQL Server databases and the DTC in order to keep the thing consistent. And sales might say, well, we can pay the price. We have huge machines. But we don't want that distributed transaction to cross this hard boundary. That's something that should never happen. So what we, what we did basically so far is that we followed the coupling, accepting that some sort of, some form of coupling must exist in a system in order to achieve the business goal. And we said, well, let's try to remove all the coupling that is crossing boundaries and adapt to that. The problem is that we solved one issue <laughs> and we just created another one. Obviously, we cannot ask people to, hey, in order to understand how your shopping cart is composed by, you need to go to these four pages and get the <laughs> sales view of the shopping cart. Keep track in your mind of that view ID in the URL. Use that on the next page and connect in your mind the dots, understanding that what was priced at $10 is the banana protector. That doesn't really work. So <laughs> basically, effectively, as soon as we split the information into multiple, contexts or boundaries, we've effectively broken the UI. 
or, or let's use the, the, the let me use the term user interface as a more general thing not necessarily a user in front of an interface but can be an API as well so we've we've broken the information that is coming outside from our system into something else and that something else can be a device can be a browser can be an API consumed by a third party whatever that third party now has to query four different APIs in order to understand, well, what's the status of the shopping cart? The easiest solution to this are read models. So let me, let me throw some technology onto the problem and solve it using basically what we can call CQRS at this point. And say, well, you know what? If we have these five services, each one owning a piece of the information, what prevents me about doing, uh, in some way, pushing, pulling, that doesn't really matter at this point. In some way, put some, inf some of this information into a central storage that we can call the view model storage. Think about Elasticsearch, for example, at this point. And allow the shopping cart to be queried out of this composed storage. Does it work? Probably the fact that I'm asking it has, <laughs> is a hint that, from my perspective, it doesn't really work. So what's the problem with this? Is that if we call this a read model, that sounds fancy and, that, and attractive. Well, I want read models. I want more technology. I want to be able to play with Elasticsearch. I want to be able to do this amazing stuff. You know what it is? It's a cache. That's what it is. So we're basically outsourcing data from owners to a land of nowhere owned by no one because there's no ownership inside the read model storage. And that's what the cache is. We're basically hoping for the best <laughs> that the cache is valid. <laughs> we're basically basing everything about our business, that's the source of truth. Because the interface will query that. Business decisions, users' decisions will be made out of the cache. And the problem is that we cannot cache everything. I intentionally picked the US Amazon web page from Italy because they cannot ship to my place. That means that I'm logged in using my Italian account, they know all the shipment addresses, and they are on the fly calculating this cannot be shipped to Italy. That means that this information cannot be cached unless they are caching a gigantic matrix of read models for all the possible combination of users and shipment addresses. And that's obviously not doable at all. That means that part of this information, this one specifically, must be evaluated on the fly. And probably sales could say something like, you know what, I can cache prices for 10 minutes. Marketing says, I can cache name and descriptions for six months. Warehouse, can I cache inventory? No. Can I cache shipping information? No. That means now that we have uh, different services or different actors in the system that are now competing to invali invalidate that cache with different strategies. So the problem, what the problem is, if we have a monolithic cache at this point and someone like sales comes in and says, well, 10 minutes just goes by, went by. So invalidate that. Well, but it, it's the entire shopping cart. Well, I don't care, invalidate it all. And now everyone needs to be invoked to say, well, refill the cache. And marketing might say, well, I don't care. <laughs> I was doing something else, so <laughs> it's not my business now. I'm not available right now. So we basically moved the coupling somewhere else at a different time without realizing it. So basically, as soon as we have a central place, what we're doing is basically we're violating the single responsibility principle. We don't have a single responsibility anymore even though we have these amazing services laid out with hard boundaries, but the cache 
is basically destroying everything that we did so far. What do we have if we look at this picture? The thing that is not that easy to spot uh, is that we have shared identifiers. So all these services, they share one thing, the same primary key. The concept is shared. And primary keys don't change. Because if primary keys change, we have a much bigger problem. And that's not, we don't even have to bother with dealing with that. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. So, and if we are in, the, in a business in which primary keys might change, well, we can come up with surrogate keys. And then a translation mechanism in every service in order to say, well, what is a URL from the outside for me as a UID, for someone else is a string, for someone else is an integer, whatever. So that's not the problem we're trying to solve right now. Given that we have shared keys across services, can we use those, those shared keys to relate in some way information in order to compose on the fly, if we really need, information to the user or from the out, for the outside? Let's call it view model composition for now. So we have a browser, just to use a sample, and a URL. Someone is hitting this route, product slash one. And that URL has an interesting characteristic. There's a key in that URL. So if that key is shared across all services, then what we can do is basically ask all services, hey, give me your piece of data related to this key, and have some kind of process that is capable of, on the fly, building the expected view model, the shopping cart in this case, and then it give it back to the browser. So the flow, if we want to come up with a diagram representing what's going on under the hood is something like this. We have services on the right, and then we have an incoming HTTP request, slash product slash one, that goes to what we can call a composition gateway. Is it, it's, it's a reverse proxy in the end. So it's someone that is intercepting all the incoming requests to our nice looking backend topology that we want to hide away from the outside and says, is there anyone interested in handling this specific request? So it's a kind of a query saying, of you services over there, there might be hundreds. Is there anyone interested in handling that specific request? And in this case, these four answer yes. Here is my handler, a piece of code that is capable of handling, of handling a request. And now what the reverse proxy does is, well, compose. Basically, four reaches in parallel over them and say, do your business. Give me back your data that you need to use to augment the view model and just augment it. So they go to their backends in whatever mean they want. In the sample, I use HTTP, and that's possible, probably the worst possible way, but can be done in many different ways. They receive data back, that happens in parallel, and finally, they compose the view model. That last can be returned to the client. So the client now asks for the shopping cart, or for a product, or for whatever, my account page, and now multiple services can kick in and say, well, here you are. Now what happens is that sales might have a cache here where cache is pricing information only for 10 minutes. In which case, this call doesn't hit the sales backend or the sales database. Hits the sales cache that is now not anymore in the land of nowhere, but it's owned by sales. So there's full ownership of every single piece in this slice. Marketing might have a cache as well, where everything is cached for a month. And if there's a typo, there's someone manually invalidating stuff in the cache. Shipping and warehouse, they have no cache at all. Or put in this way, let's say that warehouse is SAP or Salesforce. This call goes to the SAP API, if, if there's one, or to the Salesforce API. We can do that at that point, meaning that generalizing it, we can have the specific technology we need or we must have or we must accept because the, the enterprise decided that Salesforce is a solution for warehousing 
and hide that away from clients without the need of having something here, the cache that we defined before, that is owned by no one. So let's try to focus on price using that as a sample. What the code could like, look like. Who is familiar with C Sharp? Good, everyone basically. So I'm glad. <laughs> so we might have something like a sales product request handler. So we're trying to handle the slash products slash one request. Okay? So a class like product details get handler that implements this interface. I handle requests that has the matches behavior. So we are in the first phase of the matching. So there's an incoming URL. The, the reverse proxy asks everyone, are you interested? Basically calls all the matches implementation. And everyone will react saying, well, is it a products controller? Yes. Does it contain a, a key? Yes. So does it match a route template? Yes. I'm interested in this route template. Fine. I'll return true. And if I return true, what I end is a get request. So I can intercept, post, put, delete, head, whatever. If I return true, that means that append, or handle, sorry, will be called later in the process. So what the composition gateway does now is creates uh, an in-memory view model that is basically a dictionary. I'm using dynamic for the sake of the sample. Can be whatever you want, really. It's the, the demo is it's oversimplified to keep it simple, and the spite of that is 36 projects. So <laughs> I tried to avoid as much as we can infrastructure <laughs> to remove that from the equation. And what the handle method does is accept this view model that from its perspective could be empty, doesn't really care what's inside already in the view model. So retrieves from the URL the ID, goes to its own backend, retrieves the product price details, augment the view model. So basically, we retrieve, we go to the backend, and finally augment the view model. We really can retrieve data from wherever we want. So there's nothing really wrong in going to a database here. There's nothing really wrong in reading a cache, reading the text file, whatever. It's up to you to do whatever you want. So <clears throat> that doesn't really matter. All the other appenders or requests handler will do the same thing. So basically, in order to build a product page, there will be five of this. The product, the marketing one, the pricing, the sales one, the warehouse one, the, what was that, the shipping one, and so on. And they will, they will all match the slash product slash key route template. They will all be invoked, they will do their stuff, and they will all augment the view model that is finally returned to the client. The client now has a JSON kind of thing and can do whatever they want. And that's fine. We basically solved all the read problems, and we have now a user that is happy that from a single page can understand what's going on. But the problem is, what about rights then? If you think about it, <coughs> what we did is that uh, we had the quantity in three different places. So that means that when we are trying to add something to the cart, and there's the option, a drop down, that allows me to select the quantity, or we are in the shopping cart and we are trying to change the quantity, we need some way to inform three different services, or more, that the quantity changed. Because all of them need the quantity in order to be able to do their business. To do their business. We can call that, as you might guess, view model decomposition at this point. So what happens is that still we have a browser as a sample, and there's a post request. The post request goes to the shopping cart, and the post request contains an item ID and a quantity, because that's the only thing that we need at this point. So if data are already in the correct place, we just need the ID of the item, the product that we want to add to the shopping cart views scattered around in multiple services, and the quantity. That's the only thing required to do the next step, so to bring the system in the next consistent state. So we post that, and as soon as we post that, <coughs> that should go 
to oops, sorry, that should go to three different services. So they all need this information in order to do their job. So in some way, in here, we need to be able to decompose that information or given the simplicity of this one, basically copy paste this information three times into three different places. Once again, let's have a look at the code first. So shopping, uh, shipping shopping cart requests handler. So we're now looking at how shipping would look like. And as you can imagine, probably sales uh, and warehouse are exactly the same. So we have a still an I handle requests implementation that guess what matches something. We're matching a post request to the shopping cart to the add action because that's the way MVC under the works under the hood works, and it must contain an ID that is the shopping cart ID we're trying to add stuff to. So post request, and when handle is called. What we're doing is we're converting what's coming in from the request, extracting data from the HTTP form, and we are creating this kind of, let's call it DTO for now. But in the end, we're sending that over a queue to the backends. So basically, we are synchronously calling backends and all the other two appenders, the handlers, sorry. They do the same thing. So they are receiving the post request and they are sending asynchronous messages to their backend saying, hey, folks over there, someone added an item to the cart. Do your stuff now. Why are we using a queue at this point? Because things might go wrong, obviously. And in a distributed system, things go wrong all the time. <laughs> we should design for failure. So, what might happen is that uh, at this point, there's an HTTP, that's important. This is fine, and oops, this break. Now, there's no transaction here. So HTTP, someone attempted to, with the WS star uh, standards, to introduce a WS transaction kind of standard over HTTP. It was a huge failure. So, there's no transaction that is capable of telling uh, A, you should be atomically transactional and trying to add to your backend's uh, information. So the only option is to basically delegate to a queue the fact that someone should do this later on. What happened in that case? What if we could add a kind of I handle requests error to the interface, to the class, saying, hey, if something goes wrong, so if the first one succeed, but the second one fails, the first one should be interested in knowing that something went wrong. Or all the other actors in the act should be able to understand that, well, one of us failed. Who? We don't care. Something went wrong. So basically what happens is that when the handle is called, there's this request ID that we basically ignored for now. So that request ID is received from the outside and is passed along with the message. Whenever something goes wrong, the same request ID is passed into the on request error invocation. So that means that the composition gateway that is handling our orchestration in quotes, and we'll get to that in a second, is basically keeping track of the incoming request ID and saying, do the things, oops, something went wrong, compensate on request error, this request ID. And what they are doing is that, again, they are sending messages. So they're basically simply saying back to their backend, clean up a failed request message. Can be named whatever you want, roll back, whatever, doesn't really matter. So we're basically saying, at the back end, my back end shipping, please, if you ever received the previous request, roll it back. How, can, how does it work? So think about it. Think to a shopping cart. You basically have a shopping cart. Let's say that for the sake of the sample, there's just one item in the shopping cart. So there's one item in the shopping cart, and you're changing the quantity. So it's an update operation on a table. You're moving from uh, 2 to 10. 
And now someone tells you, revert it back. And your only option is to answer, what should I revert back? I have no idea what I did before. I have no idea even if I did it, because I might be the one and that on the back end failed. So you're asking me to, to revert something I never did. Is there a solution to that? The easiest one is basically to say, since we're passing along this request ID everywhere, we can use that to keep track of requests. So going to the lowest possible level, what a table in shipping could look like. We have the cart ID that is always the same. So it's my cart ID. We have product IDs because we're changing the quantity, for example. And we have quantities and we have request IDs. So it's an append only kind of model. So whenever we're trying to add an item to the cart, huh, we don't update anything. We never update stuff in the backend. We just insert, insert, insert. And whenever we try to read, huh, we basically sum this. <coughs> and we know that we have one, four, eight, nine items in the cart for this product ID. So it's effectively a group by plus account at trading time. Okay? Given that shipping owns the entire model, shipping can do whatever they want in order to keep track of these kind of changes. And it looks like event sourcing, but it's not quite event sourcing because we don't, need, we don't want event sourcing in this model. Event sourcing can be a solution to this kind of problem. And there are scenarios, the accounting scenario working this way. And from the accounting perspective, unless you are Italian and we're recording, I know, you cannot delete, delete anything. So <laughs> Italians can. Yeah. Rules are made to be broken, you know. <laughs> so it means that in an accounting kind of service, you want to transition from an append-only model to probably an event-sourced model, where instead of deleting a row in case of a failed request, you're appending another row with the negative information. So if I want to delete this uh, attempt, uh, I'm going to append another one with minus one. And that basically compensate. If I'm going to compensate this, there will be another one with minus four. But given that shipping doesn't really care about keeping track of what users were doing while managing the cart, shipping can simply wipe the row and delete it. That's good enough from shipping perspective. If shipping was the failing one, shipping will receive a compensate request and say, well, I never did it. So I can safely ignore the thing and basically continue working. I was the failing one, but I'm sorry. <laughs> basically, I don't need to compensate. The important thing of what we observed so far is that there's no orchestration at all anywhere. So the, the two-phase composition approach or decomposition approach, matching plus handle, makes so that, uh, makes so that uh, the composition gateway or the reverse proxy looking at it from the, technical, the technological perspective, knows nothing about handlers. So it's simply using dependency injection or inversion of control to say, is there anyone interested in this? If yes, do your stuff and come back to me when you're done. I'll wait for you because I have an incoming HTTP request to satisfy. If there's no one, 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 one only or 10,000, well, 10,000 maybe it's a problem, but 10 of them, doesn't really matter. The composition gateway doesn't need to say, marketing, do this for me. Sales, do this for me. Shipping, do this for me. It's up to them to decide, I want to be part of this request. So otherwise, there's coupling. So whenever you have an orchestrator, you have coupling once again. Because if the business comes and say, well, on the product page, you know what? I want to be able to display related products. That's another appender in the game, basically. But if we need to change the orchestrator, now we have coupling once again, because there must be an orchestrator team that we need to knock the door and say, folks, please, can you do this for me? And they might reply, no, we cannot deploy now. We're in the process of a big change. It will take six months. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So that's the, the problem of coupling, especially the, the largest the system is, the, the, the lower coupling you want. And that's the thing you need to fear and escape from. What I've achieved so far, one interesting thing, that is called full vertical slices. 
So we're now able to say each service or microservice or autonomous component, call it whatever you want, it doesn't really matter, owns behavior and data and the view model composition part, basically the UI. Okay? So the, the part that represents the, the shape of the data from the user perspective. I'd like to stress a little bit uh, on the behavior and data. I should remove data from this slide. In my perspective, from my perspective, one of the biggest mistakes uh, domain-driven design leads people to is thinking that data is the important part, whether behavior is the important part. Data are just a side effect of behavior. We're modeling behaviors of people. We're not modeling the shopping cart. We're modeling the fact that the fact that people want to add items to the cart, they want to remove items from the cart, change quantity, buy stuff, and things like that. The fact that in order to do that, you know, we need to store information on, on disks uh, because we need to reboot machines, uh, it, it, it's a technical implementation detail. Behavior is the only important thing or the most important thing. So we, if we start thinking about behaviors only, then we will end up with nice boundaries because behaviors are bounded by default. I need this information that are private to me in order to achieve this goal. That's it. However, it's not that easy once again. <laughs> so as soon as we have hard boundaries, we realize that in some way services need to talk to each other. Ha! <laughs> So what? Let's try to look at two new business, two new business requirements. The business come and say, well, I'd like to notify users if they had um, something in the cart for one week and they did nothing. It's a kind of pressure on you. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> or, well, if they never come back after a month, let's say we wipe the carts because we, we value space on disk and we want to Delete it. It's just, I'm just making up things. So we have this scenario, and we, we need some way to allow services to talk to each other, because conceptually we said that sales own the shopping cart. So the ad operation is conceptually owned by sales. It's sales that is the one that is responsible from the business perspective for the shopping cart concept. So the add to cart item, Whenever we add something to the cart, sales sets a one-week timeout. And Adam will talk more about coding in the future later today. So if you're interested in how this thing works uh, and what you can do with that, join him. And sales at the same time set a one-month timeout to do the second operation, wipe cards. When the first timeout expires, sales raises an event. That is, something happened. A cart got stale, and that event goes onto a bus that is handled by marketing that does one thing, annoy the user with an email. So they're basically sending a notification saying, hey, you have left leftovers over there. Are you interested in them? After a month, the cart got expired, and that's interesting for basically all the services. In this case, I'm using just two of them as a sample. So warehouse and shipping needs to wipe their vision of the cart because we have the cart now that is dispersed across multiple services. So they need to be aware of the fact that a cart needs to be deleted. To some extent, we don't really need it because if sales is the one owning the, the cart ID concept, we can basically simply delete the cart from sales and we're going to have orphans here. They won't ever be queried by anyone. We're just wasting space. There can be a batch job <laughs> at late night that every month look at orphans' cards and wipe them. But you got the point. So if, you, if, if we want, we can notify other services that something happened, and the happened is very important. So it's something that is in the past immutable that cannot change, and they can react to that doing whatever, you, whatever they want. The very important bit that all what we said so far discloses is that now events can be as thin as event name and IDs. We don't need fat events anymore. That's the horrible name the industry uses. So we don't need to share information at all. 
if data are private to services and they are already in the place they need to be, we don't need to put data on a queue. We don't need to have coupling traveling on a queue because we just need to say, that's done. Here is the ID of the thing that I did. And since we said keys are stable, they won't change, that event won't ever change. If it changes, it's because there's a disruptive business change. At a certain point, the business says, well, <laughs> we don't use shopping carts anymore. <laughs> That's not a technical problem. So, or Amazon started selling cars in Italy. It's not like selling this thing. It, it's selling, yes. <laughs> but the, <laughs> the business process is so completely different uh, that it's basically a brand new company behind the scenes. So the final big picture of this is something like uh, we have services. They have behaviors and data. And then there's a bus that acts like a communication layer under the hood that allows services to exchange thin events. So just names and IDs, the minimum required to make other people understand what happened. And then they have a foot on the, in the UI using this view model composition technique. So unfortunately, we have very little time at conferences. So if you're interested in seeing this live, there's a demo composed of 36 projects that demos the, these four business requirements of the shopping cart. So you get how complex it can be. And if you want to dive more into service boundaries, here is a link of, to a, a set of videos from Houdi Dahan, that is my boss, by the way, talking about boundaries. So to conclude, which are the takeaways here? So let's talk a little bit about uh, what we can extract from what we talked about so far. Boundaries are the, really the, the key to success. It's nice to listen to Eric Evans saying, if I would rewrite the book today, I would put service boundary, bounded context at the beginning of the book. Because that's the most important concept that should go through before even starting to think about an implementation. If you get boundaries wrong, it's not going to end well. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but it's, 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 it's the first step into the coupling world. <laughs> so you, you really need to get service boundaries if you're talking about SOA or bounded context if you're talking about domain-driven design. Right, otherwise it's very easy to fall into the trap of coupling. One of the things that I use to signal myself Oh, so maybe something is wrong, is every single time I have this desire to add new technology to solve a problem, uh, let's go back to the whiteboard. We might got boundaries wrong. So technology is never a solution to business problems. Business people, they don't talk about technology ever. They won't ever tell you, can we cache that information for a while? And if they did, change the business. <laughs> So they, they don't care about technology. They talk about behaviors. We introduce technology to try to compensate for things that we did wrong in the past. So be aware of that. The other thing that I realized in my career is that the user mental model that <laughs> at the center point we celebrated that, wow, we need to implement the user mental model, can badly influence your design. Users and business stakeholders, they tend to talk about the way they see data on screens, the way they perceive the information flowing inside the application. They don't, they don't talk about boundaries. It's up to us to understand in the way they talk about something where boundaries can be identified. So that, that, there's an important role in the industry that is the information architect. So UX people, there's UX people that dedicate their life to information architecture. They're the key actor that needs to be brought in very quickly. That is the kind of mediator between the business people talking, someone knowing how to translate that into a UI, UI in, in the general sense of behaviors on a screen. And that is the one that can say, well, I know that this information doesn't really belong to the cart, but should go there and stuff like that. So, and that's something you usually tend to forget about. So we, we transition immediately to someone saying, we have a shopping cart, public class shopping cart. 
with a list of ID, public list of shopping cart items. Items. <laughs> and we, we're doomed at that point. We're toasted. So the, the third takeaway is do not name things prematurely. That's the hardest part. As I said, a business stakeholder says, well, there's products, public class product. We have customers, public class customer. A customer has a name, public string name, and the customer has a status, public kind of a num, status. And then the third thing they say is, whenever we sell something, the price depends on the customer status. If they are a gold customer, 10% discount. And now we have coupling. Because customers are owned by the CRM, and products are owned by sales from the pricing perspective, and we never need to, need, we need to show a price, we need to combine information coming from two different boundaries. Coupling once again. So, behaviors define how to aggregate data. Group data that change together in the same boundary. Whenever we have data cooperating with the behavior in order to produce an output, whatever output that is, is a message, an event, a data on a screen, doesn't matter. Data that change together should stay together. They are, looking at that from the technical perspective, they are transactional boundaries. So it's important to respect transactional boundaries, and they should stay together. But if you think about the previous sample, if you have uh, the customer status and the price that should stay together, because they, they participate in defining the, the, the selling price on the website, how do you name that? There isn't a class that can be named price based on customer status class. Doesn't make any sense. That's a policy. That's a behavior we're modeling. That's a kind of a rule that we're modeling in the system that has its own boundary probably. Isolated from the others because they change together. And finally, use UI composition techniques to bring everything back together in the UI, because that's the end goal, so one of the end goals. We want to be able to allow users to play nicely with our UI without depending on things like Postman. If you ask my wife to use Postman, that probably doesn't really end well. So <laughs> they want a nice looking UI with a product. Their mental model ends up in the UI and stays there. In a distributed system, the, the model of the system in the back end doesn't really fit the user mental model. So we need to be aware of that. So my name is Mauro Servienti. I work for Particular Software as a solution architect. Here are some information and thank you very much. <laughs>